Yeah. Spot on. Hello again, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the third in our series of interviews with the advisory board members of our Shelley 200 conference. With me today, I have Dr. Will Bowers giving some of his thoughts about Shelley's works ahead of his talk at the conference next summer. He has studied at UCL, Oxford and Yale and currently lectures at Queen Mary University of London. He has published very widely on Romantic and 18th century poetry and many of his publications focus on the literary and cultural exchange between Italy and England. He is also an editor of the Longman Annotated Poems of Shelley. Hi Will, uh, I was wondering if we could start um, by talking about your first experience of reading Shelley. Uh, literally my first experience of reading Shelley was at school. Uh, I think before GCSEs, um, I had this incredible English teacher for most of my time at school called Jeremy Thomas, who had been taught in Cambridge in the mid seventies. So like the embers of the lever sites were still around. Uh, he, so he didn't like Shelley much, but we had this uh, dragon book of verse, uh, which still exists actually. I think it's probably called the New Dragon Book of Verse now. And it was an anthology that had, had everything in it, really. Tons of Keats, tons of Wordsworth, tons of Milton, tons of Arnold, uh, Emily Dickinson. But it had uh, Ozymandias and the poem that we call Time, uh, Unfathomable Sea, Whose Waves Are Years, that one. Uh, and we did those. I think many of the classes probably just did two or three poems for anthology and moved on. Uh, but this teacher that I had, uh, who's sadly no longer with us, was a quite a, he was quite a eccentric chap. And we spent an awful lot of time going through each poem. Uh, I think probably to the detriment of reading Tom Sawyer or some other uh, dreadful uh, novel. And then, but then properly at university as an undergraduate, um, I was taught quite a traditional romanticism paper, um, which had very untraditional lectures by strange people who weren't experts in the field. It was a big thing at UCL to have I don't know, Victorianists giving a lecture on Chaucer and uh, modernists giving lectures on Romanticism. And it's something that I'm hugely in favor of. Uh, so I think Matthew Beaumont, who's a kind of late 19th century expert on anarchy and um, utopia, uh, gave a lecture on Shelley that I remember really well. And uh, then I got into him from there, really read everything I could. Uh, got the Longman from the library, um, wrote an undergrad dissertation on Episcopalian and um, Italian visionary poetry, things like the Vita Nuova. Um, and then that spiraled into master's work and PhD work and a book. And I'm very boring. Like I've basically just had one idea that I've plugged since I was 19 and it's done okay, but it's starting to run out of uh, petrol a bit. So I need to find another idea at some point. That is a good idea. Um... <laughs> So uh, I was wondering as well if you could tell us a bit about any uh, Shelley related ongoing projects that you have. Well, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, I'm involved in the Longman Annotated Poems of Shelley, uh, volumes five and six, that should come out uh, next year. And that was my, uh, uh, my first academic job was on that project. I was a MHRA research associate straight out of a PhD. I mean, like weeks out of a PhD working with Michael Rossington in Newcastle on that project. And I, you've interviewed Calvin, so you know that's a kind of hugely long running project. It was put under contract with Jeffrey Matthews in the late fifties, along with Alistair Fowler's Paradise Lost, John Carey's Shorter Poems, Milton, um, and was being worked on by Jeffrey right up to his untimely death in the 80s and then Kelvin took over the project uh, and then Kelvin recruited some more people and then Michael recruited some more people and I'm one of those people that was recruited so uh, the editors of volume five and six are Colleen Adamson, uh, myself, uh, Michael Rossington, Kelvin Everest and Matt Linden Abagodi so we've got a real range of people and a range of expertise um, we've each got different things that we like and different things that we don't like I, you know I couldn't take on somebody else's poems and perhaps they couldn't take on mine so that's coming out and being finalized at the moment and that meant doing the triumph of life um, and being responsible for the triumph of life which was a big responsibility uh, and I hope the edition will be a, a success um, with that. Uh, the next big thing that I'm doing um, probably having not learned the lesson of an edition 
that was contracted in 1959 that's going to finish in 2022. Uh, me and two colleagues, uh, Andrew Hodgson at the University of Birmingham and Oliver Clarkson at the University of Oxford have taken on uh, a new three volume edition of Shelley's Letters, uh, which is now under contract with Oxford University Press, um, which is going to be a complete new edition from manuscript of uh, all of Shelley's letters. So the 741 extant letters and any letters that we uh, arrive at in the course of our uh, edition. I mean, if, if Longman or the Johns Hopkins edition is anything to go by, you, know, you do come across poems on the, on the way or new things, often scrappy fragments, but still poems nevertheless. And I can't imagine that wouldn't be the same with the letters. So that's a big project. Um, we, it'll be finished in the mid 2030s, which is a really, it's a really strange thing to think about uh, in your head that you're on a project which will finish. I mean, I've got a, I've got an 18 month old daughter, so she'll be 15 when it's finished, and that's that's a re well, I mean, she might be 25 when it's finished, but um, but it's projected to be finished when she's 15, and that's a kind of it's a really humbling thing to think about how far in advance something like that is. Uh, so that's. That's the kind of major editorial project that I'm involved in. And yeah, I'll, I'll I try and do an editorial thing and a critical thing at the same time at all times. So there will be other critical things I'm involved in, which will have kind of Shelley around them. But the big looming spectacle is, uh, is in a new edition of The Letters. Very exciting, very big project. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I was thinking next if you could just expand a little bit and tell us a bit about the um, editorial history of Shelley's letters and, and why this new edition is going to be so important. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope it's going to be important. Uh, the history of Shelley's letters is a quite strange one. Um, it kind of mirrors the history of Shelley's poetry to a certain extent, but perhaps is even more strange because for a long time, Shelley's letters haven't been considered to be very good. Uh, I mean, just as Shelley's poetry wasn't considered to be very good um, for a long time uh, in the early 20th century, Eliot, Levis, that kind of thing. Uh, the same is the case for Shelley's letters that have always been compared to Keats's and Byron's. Uh, it's, I mean, it doesn't, it's not borne out by a reading of these letters. Uh, anyone who can read those letters of 1818 in Italy or those letters in the last six months of Shelley's life and not think that their masterpieces is daft, but it's by the by. Uh, the history of the letters, they started coming out very soon after Shelley died in strange little publications like Stockdale's Budget. Um, he was somebody who had uh, letters from Shelley. Uh, so he published them in his little journal. And then in the various lives of Shelley and his contemporaries. So things like Moore, uh, Hunt, um, Medwin, uh, you know, biographical works, uh, Peacock's uh, works. So they kind of dripped and they dripped out. And then like all these things, um, Mary got involved, uh, Mary Shelley and did what she always does, which is the best job. Um, and she published essays uh, and letters from abroad in 1840, the second volume of which is um, a series of letters uh, from Italy, uh, which are, I think probably the best letters that Shelley has. Um, so then you've got a series of kind of competing relic projects, people publishing the odd letter here, the odd letter there, a Jane Lady Shelley publishing letters, nothing quite being collected uh, in a, uh, in what we consider to be a kind of organized fashion until 1909, uh, you get uh, Roger Ingpen's edition, uh, which is an impressive thing. He adds to that Shelley in England, 1917, and then you get the first kind of proper edition of Shelley's letters, um, Inkpen and Walter Peck. This edition that's often called the Julian edition uh, for boring reasons, um, but that's a huge edition, 1926, 1930, that has uh, poetry, prose and letters in it. And it. Some people still might think it's the best edition of Shelley's everything. It's the, it's the only one-stop shop that you can get so if you own that edition, you have the bulk of what is good. In fact, you have just about everything that's good. Um, it's one of those things about editing that's kind of depressing. Uh, 
if you think about the most edited, most changed poem by Shelley, you might think of The Triumph of Life or something. And yet, if you look at the very first published edition of The Triumph of Life, 1824 posthumous poems, and you look at a brand new edition, Nora Crook's edition in uh, Johns Hopkins or my edition in the new Longman, the amount that's different is, is substantial, but does it change the meaning of the poem vastly? Uh, perhaps not. So that's why things like Julian are still amazing things, even though the text of the letters are often corrupt and doesn't have as many letters as later editions. Anyway, same old story after that, L little bits of letters being found here and there, uh, Shelley in Oxford, the Athenians, things like that, little publications adding um, various discoveries. And then the first academic edition, uh, Frederick L. Jones, uh, I've got it here. You can, this guy uh, with his dust jacket, you don't often see it with his dust jacket. Uh, and that's a two volume edition published by AUP in 1964. Um, people are often down on Jones uh, and people often think that to propose a new edition of the letters, you have to hammer Jones. So people I think imagine from the outside that when you submit, you send to AUP and say, we need a new edition of Shelley's letters that would consist of saying the current edition is terrible. It doesn't work. Um, Jones isn't terrible. There's loads of problems with Jones, but many of those are the problems of one person doing an edition of Shelley's letters in 1964. Um, there was a number of factors. Uh, he didn't have access to about a hundred letters, 120 letters uh, in the Fort Summer Library in anything apart from transcripts. So he couldn't look at the manuscripts. Um, a number of manuscripts weren't available to him apart from that. Uh, he didn't have all of the letters of other people that we now have. So he didn't have Tchaikovsky's edition of Peacock's letters. He didn't have Bennett's edition of Mary Shelley's letters. So there were loads of factors that make it a slightly less good edition than we might like, but Jones is still often pretty good. Um, that's two volumes. It also doesn't have the kind of annotation that I think we expect now uh, from an edition of letters. Uh, a number of foreign languages just aren't translated which is, you know, I'm sure really useful to a intelligent reader of the early 70s or late 60s. But I think nowadays, for example, we require long passages of French to be translated, um, which is, you know, maybe our fault, but it's, it's a fact. Um, so that's where they are. And we kind of position ourselves as an edition which says a couple of things. One, uh, we want the annotation to be vastly improved uh, or expanded. I think improved a bit too um, of a value judgment but expanded. Allusions identified, you know, there's tons of allusions to Milton, for example, in the letters that uh, Jones just presumes that readers are going to understand. And I don't think we should presume that. Mm -hmm. Tons of references to the Bible, to Shakespeare, things like that, need explaining. Also, the, the letters in Jones are very sanitized. So he just regularizes punctuation throughout. Um, and if you've ever seen a Shelley letter, Shelley's letters change hugely depending on who he's writing to and about what. So if you look at the letters from just after the elopement uh, with Harriet uh, and you see him writing to his father looking for money and looking for approval, these are incredibly neat documents, right? Beautifully spaced, commas in the right places, your most obedient servant, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they're beautiful. And if you look at a letter he's writing to somebody when he's in haste or when he's unimpressed, uh, they become much scrappier or with somebody he's very familiar with hog or peacock, he's much happier to kind of be rough and be ready. Now, you wouldn't get that from Jones's edition because it flattens out mm -hmm. what you have in front of you. So it kind of sanitizes the letter so that readers have no idea of um, the level of formal dexterity that Shelley shows at the level of writing a letter. Um, now, I don't propose that we have an edition that's a facsimile where we show pictures of the letters and try and translate that entirely to the page, but things like misspellings, repetitions, strike throughs, they're all gonna be in our edition. And in that we kind of follow the, the trend of major editions of letters that have come out recently. Uh, Pam Clement's ongoing uh, letters of William Godwin, uh, the new edition of Hopkins's letters that try and show the printed page a bit more. Uh, and that's, I think, if you were to kind of evaluate how our edition takes editing to another step of Shelley's letters, that's how we'd be doing it. Um, it goes into quite technical textual stuff as well. 
So watermarks, um, printer's marks, you know, each Shelley letter has a postage page stamp at various times that can give you an idea of when it was sent and how it was sent, which can improve dating. Um, Bruce Barker Benfield did a number of beta radiographs of letters in the late 80s, so basically scanning it on a complex scanner, which shows the watermark that can tell us the date of the paper and things like that. And there are instances where that's really important because people say, well, this was definitely written at this date, but it can't possibly be the case on the basis of various marks on the paper. So yeah, it gets a bit technical and translating that to a reader is really difficult because you also want addition to Shelley's letters that's usable, right? Yeah. So that's the kind of big thing. There are books about Shelley that are usable by experts. You think about the Bodley and Shelley manuscripts volumes, right? If you know how to use them, they're amazing things. They do take a bit of a lead in to getting used to them though. Yeah. I, the letters can't be like that. The letters have to be available to be used by an undergraduate who wants to go to and find out what Shelley's letters are, but they also need to be useful to people who are experts. And that's the kind of difficult balance that the new project's got. Um, so yeah, three volumes, gonna come out sequentially. Um, we're, I don't know, 55, 60 letters in. And one interesting thing you might wanna know about is that we've made this incredibly great principles document about how we're gonna edit every single letter and really spent hours, days, weeks arguing over really fine points. And then we got down and had a number of sample letters that we did that with. But then when you get a, sam a sample of five letters, these principles might be okay. When you've got 60 letters, different things happen all the time, different ways of presenting a letter happen, different types of it, ink come into play, all sorts of other things. And so you, know, you realize that principles are great, but these things are con constantly being modified and changed. Um, so yeah, that's where we are. I mean, you can ask me in 15 years if it's a success. <laughs> that sounds really challenging. Um, so yeah, uh, as a, a young Shelley scholar, um, what has been your experience of the developments that Shelley scholarship has changed? And in what direction do you see the future of Shelley studies heading in? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's nice to be considered young. Uh, <laughs> less and less the case. Um, yeah, I think we're in a really interesting space at the moment because we're getting towards the point where we've got complete or near complete modern editions of Shelley's poetry. And that's not been the case for a long time. And Shelley's probably been the only major poet in which that's not the case. So what that might herald, and what you know, God willing it will herald is a return to the poems and a return to thinking about the poetry. Um, now, I'm not sure how open the university and the academy is to that kind of, um, quite formal, what they might consider to be old fashioned approach to returning to the poems. Um, but that would be something that I intend to do and I'm doing. Uh, but where it might go uh, and where it seems to go a lot is towards Shelley's life, um, which I'm not interested in at all, uh, apart from where it impinges on his poetry or his letters um, and a kind of fascination with a cult of Shelley uh, which normally has a tendency of reducing Shelley to kind of very, very essential qualities. Shelley was colon revolutionary. Shelley was a radical. Shelley was these things. Shelley was all of these things. That's not to say not. But these kind of essentializing things often end up seeing him in the light of the present, uh, much more so than in the light of his work and his times. And they also kind of, I think, tend to get away from the poetry quite a lot. Um, so I, I see that happening all the time. I try and um, caution it when I see students do it, uh, of my own, obviously. I don't caution other people's students. Um, but I think it's understandable um, because it, it gives you a way into the story uh, of this poetry. But I really hope that we can keep that being a way in, but not the, the sole way that we engage with these things. Um, I think the recovery of a lot of Mary Shelley's work has been really good for, for what people call Shelley studies. Um, so uh, finding, not finding, but 
giving a proper critical addition to a number of Mary's novels, uh, Mary's letters, Mary's journals, means that we have more primary text to, to appreciate. We can also appreciate the collaboration between the two, which I think is important. So maybe that's a way to go that is still textually focused. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, so the direction could be, uh, you know, a return to quite serious consideration of a person who wrote an unbelievable amount of poems. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the daunting thing about Shelley. You know, the, the Shelley canon is huge. It might even be too big. I could quite happily get rid of quite a few poems from the Shelley canon. But th th there's a lot to say about that poetry. Um, but I can understand why we, we, it's not that kind of approach. It's not, um, taken exclusively at the moment. Um, now, there's really interesting work going on at the moment about that, um, you know, taking Shelley um, in quite theoretical directions. Uh, people like Alex Freer, um, which is fantastic. Uh, thinking about Shelley in a kind of, uh, or somebody like Matt Linda and Abagodi, who thinks about Shelley and Benjamin. Um, there's also uh, a lot of work on uh, rediscovering um, Shelley's ideas about um, colonialism, Shelley and Ireland uh, is a really interesting and growing subject. I know a PhD student in Oxford who's doing really interesting work on that. Um, and uh, people looking on things like Hellas as a, as a poem about colonialism. And I think that kind of work is often presented as new as it should be, but it's really good that it's new and focused on the text. I think too often we think that in order to be new, the approach has to be non-textual. I don't think that's, loads of people who are working at the moment show that's not the case. Absolutely. Um, so uh, as our last question, um, I thought we'd end on um, asking you, which is your favorite Shelley poem? Difficult question. It's, it's, it's an impossible question <laughs> um, because they're all, they're not all great, God. A lot of them, like I say, my, my Shelley Cannon, I think is much smaller than most people's. I quite happily get rid of anything written before Mont Blanc. Just put it on a pyre, get rid of it, never want to see it again. Now look at that, see shock face, these are good. I'm fine with that, but I'm, I'm quite happy with that as a, as a thing, you know, if I never had to read Alastor again, it would be no crime to me. Um, but, you know, people love Alastor, I'm good on them. Uh, I mean, I get rid of things after Mont Blanc as well. But uh, um, the thing is, I think it's a matter of mood. So I'm going to dodge the question and say, my favorite Shelley poem uh, to teach and to think about on a regular basis is Mont Blanc. Uh, it's brilliant to teach students because it's difficult, but it also benefits from being taught. So it opens up over the course of a two hour seminar and a one hour lecture, um, which is brilliant, you know, which is always uh, good because so many poems within the space of a two hour seminar, either you've, 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 you've squeezed out what you can from the group within an hour, and then you've got to find something to do for the next hour, or two hours into a Prometheus Unbound seminar, I think you're still in the foothills a bit. So um, Mont Blanc for that, for um, speaking to students about what it's like to live in a secular age, what it's like to live in an environmental uh, age, also what it's like to read effing brilliant poetry. Like, you know, there's, there's so much, so many just phrases that in a romanticism course, you could always bring up from Mont Blanc teaches awful doubt, you know, just ways in which it can kind of be a central poem for romanticism. But things I'd probably read more than that, uh, Hymn to Mercury, the, the funnier things, Leptin and Reich is born, um, The Witch. That's the kind of Shelley that I really enjoy, the, sli the slightly winking Shelley, the slightly less serious, the one who enjoys puns. Uh, so the Cyclops might be another thing for that as well. That kind of Shelley who's uh, brilliant, but quite subtle in his brilliance, not, not necessarily the grander Shelley of the more formal poetry. Things like Hebeskidian, Triumph, Prometheus, which are all brilliant in different ways, but I tend to go back more to the kind of cakes and tea of, of the more relaxed Shelley. Absolutely. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. I just can't believe how appalled you were by the Alastor comment, but it's fine. I, I like, I know Alastor's great, you know. I, I, I did my master's dissertation on that. Don't slander no, Alastor. It's just not my cup of tea. Lots of people think it's brilliant. I, I'm one of them. 
lots of them. <laughs> all of a sudden, there's one of the great poems of all time. It's just, I'm not one of them. Well, thank you for joining me, Will. Um, and thanks to everybody for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And the links to all of our social medias and the information about the conference will be in the description box below this video. Um, and we'll see you for the next interview. Thank you.